Hey everyone, this is Vida Master Kostya Kavutsky here for chess.com and today I'm going to be showing you some typical ideas in Rook Endgames where one side has this extra A pawn and with some pawns over here on the king side. In this video I'm just going to cover a few basic principles and show a few ideas that will help you play this endgame with pretty good skill. So the first thing that you should learn is the idea of where your rook is best placed. And that is whether you're on the attacking side with the extra pawn or on the defending side trying to make a draw even though you're down a pawn. And in both cases the best positioning for either rook is behind the passed pawn. For example, a square like a1 would be the best spot for either rook. And the reason for that is that on this square, or if the pawn is advanced, you know, to a4, then a2 or a3 would also be a good square for either rook, is that that rook will then remain much more active than its counterpart. So let me show you guys really quickly this concept through just a sample uh, variation. So let's say it's White's turn here. I think most strong players would play either Rook A1 immediately or start with A4 followed by Rook A1. So let's say we play A4. The Black Rook is probably going to try to attack this pawn and stop it from advancing. And now Rook A1. So if Black lets us we should try to advance this pawn as far as we can. And the reason for that is that the opposing rook here is going to be really passive as with each pawn move we're limiting its mobility. And eventually when the pawn gets to a7, if this rook ever leaves the a8 square, we'll queen and obviously we'll be able to win the game. So the reason why having this pass pawn on the outside is so strong is that even if black's king can make its way over to the queen side and try to win this pawn, by the time that they do that, we can bring our king in. And once they take our a pawn, we'll trade rooks, and our king will be much closer to the remaining king side pawns, which means we'll have a pretty simple winning king and pawn endgame. So for that reason, having your rook behind your passed pawn is really strong because you restrict the opponent's rook's activity and your opponent will never be able to win this pawn because once he does, you can trade off the rooks and then your king will be better placed for the king and pawn endgame that happens after that. And maybe it's not such a good idea to immediately push your pawn all the way to a7. I would recommend just bringing your king to the center of the board first, where you can then decide to either support your pawn to queen or go after the weak king side pawns. So now I want to show you guys what happens if black's rook gets behind the passed pawn and white's rook, the attacking rook, has to stay in front of it. And now you'll see there's a great difference in activity of the rooks. This rook has a lot of mobility here because it can move up and down and it's not attached to attacking the A pawn. It can still go this way if it needs to. Meanwhile, White's Rook is stuck on the A file defending this pawn. Obviously, if player playing White was to move his Rook away from the A file, Black could just win the A4 pawn and the game would be pretty easily drawn. So eventually, what White needs to do here if they're trying to win this game is bring the rook to a8 and then let's say black waits and push their pawn until we get something like this. Now I don't think it's such a good idea to push this pawn to a7 and the reason is that the only way white can really win this endgame is if he can bring his king all the way to b7 to support the queening of the pawn. 
So the reason you need to keep your pawn on a6 is that once the king does get dangerously close to the passed pawn, a defensive idea for black is to start checking the king. And with the pawn on a6, white's always going to have the square on a7 to hide his king from the checks, whereas then he can move his rook away, possibly to the b-file, and then promote his pawn with the help of his king and his rook. With the pawn on a7, once the white king reaches b7 or b6, the black rook can just start checking the king, and the king will have no way to get any sort of shelter from the checks, and black will be able to make an easy draw. So for that reason, I would recommend keeping your pawn on a6. Now that doesn't mean white can really win this end game. Well, they can, it's just not so simple. One thing I want to point out now is that if the pawn is on a7, one of the benefits, at least having the pawn on a7, is now the black rook is tied to the a file. If the black rook moves to d2 or e2, then the white rook will just step over and he'll make a queen on the next move. With the pawn on a6, the black rook still has some freedom where he doesn't have to stay on the a file because white isn't threatening to immediately queen. So with that in mind, I want to show you guys a few more typical ideas that you should try to remember when you have this kind of endgame. Try to remember this structure here that both sides have set up on the king side. This is generally considered the best sort of structure for this kind of endgame, and the reason is that both kings can now access the center of the board pretty easily, and they're both covered from checks along the second or seventh rank. Let's say it's Black's turn and he had his pawn on f5. And then the white king tries to come out. Black king also tries to come out. White king gets closer to the pawn. Black king comes out here. Now white can actually win this endgame right away by playing a7. And the point is that now white is threatening to give this check, followed by queening the pawn. This isn't possible with the king on g7 or h7, because then the king can just take the rook if it gives a check, and white isn't defending the a8 square anymore, so he can't promote. One thing you really have to keep in mind here is that if your king leaves the 7th rank, you might be vulnerable to some checks by the white rook, giving white time to promote his pawn. That's why keeping the pawn here on f7 is a good idea, because now your king can come out to f6 and f5 without worrying about being checked by the white rook. Another possible trick here is that, let's say the pawn is on f5, and you decide to make your way over this way without leaving the 7th rank. Now the problem is white can push his pawn, and the idea is that he has this resource available to him, bringing the rook all the way to the other side. So he's threatening to queen, and when black takes this pawn, white has rook h7 check, winning the rook. So that's why it's very inadvisable to try and bring your king out towards the past pawn because it usually just won't get there in time and you'll fall into some sort of promotion trick. The best thing you can do here as black if you're defending is that while the white king is making its way over to the pawn to the b7 square to support the pawn to promotion, you should try to get your king down to white's pawns and start capturing them. So eventually what will happen is white will be able to promote his pawn and black will have to give up the rook for it. But at the very least, if you can collect these three kingside pawns with your king, then you'll have three connected passers which you can then use as your own passed pawn counterplay. And these endgames are really tricky and other than what I've told you, there's very little general advice I can give you. The only thing I can really say is that 
these rook endgames here require from both players really accurate calculation. If you can develop your ability to calculate variations very accurately, that will be a big advantage in playing any sort of endgame where both sides have competing plans. Right? White's plan here is to promote his pawn, while Black's plan is to get his king down to the kingside pawns and try to create a pass pawn of his own. And whether Black is in time to create this counterplay before White can promote his pawn and win the rook um, is all a matter of you know the details of the specific position and really depends on the end game and calculation skill of the two players. Last thing I want to mention here is that if White did foolishly push his pawn all the way to a7, all you really need to do to hold this endgame as black is just move your king back and forth or move your rook back and forth because there's no progress that White can make with this pawn on a7. Whenever the rook leaves, we'll just take the a7 pawn and even if the king gets all the way to b7, we can just start giving checks with our rook and the king won't be able to find any shelter. So really quickly, couple of things I want you guys to take away from this video that will really help you in your endgames. Try to get your rook behind the pass pawn, whether you're the attacking side or the defending side. Next, if you are trying to promote, keep in mind that your king is going to need a shelter from possible checks from the enemy rook. Last but not least, if you are down a pawn and trying to defend, the best thing you can do to give yourself chances to draw is to create a pass pawn of your own, which is possible because White's king eventually is just going to have to leave the king side and leave those pawns vulnerable if he hopes to ever promote his pawn and win the game. So with that, I wish you guys good luck, and hopefully this video will serve as a reminder to play your endgames logically and with purpose. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks a lot for listening, and I'll see you around on chess.com.